This is Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, brought to you by the Iowa Soybean Association. Your daily recap of the information that affects Iowa's farmers, producers, and consumers, right here in the heart of the heartland. With reports from our award-winning broadcast team of Dustin Hoffman, Riley Smith, and Mark Magnuson. Now, from the IARN studios in Des Moines, here's Mark Magnuson. Hello and welcome into Ag Matters PM on the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Mark Magnuson. Today is Friday, November 11th, 2022. It is Veterans Day, and we are so glad you could join us for today's show. In today's episode, I have another segment of Between the Pods. I will speak with Iowa Soybean Association Senior Director of Market Development, Grant Kimberly. And as always, we will take a look at the wet at the Ag Weather Outlook. But first, let's run down the markets. It's time now for the Ag Matters PM Closing Market Summary, your source for market analysis and settlement prices from the day's trade in Chicago, courtesy of the folks at agmarket.net. At the end of another trading day, we are joined by Jacob Burks of agmarket.net for some market analysis. Jacob, what did we see on the grain markets today? Uh, the grain markets, uh, you know, it wrapped up the week on a positive note. The corn market ended up closing three to four higher across the board. Uh, saw a little bit of uh, support down around some of these moving averages, some technical support. Uh, beans came, uh, gave, gained back everything that they gave up yesterday. Uh, you can blame a little bit of that on some headlines of China uh, lifting some of their COVID restrictions. But if you look deep, to, deep into that, uh, it, you know, there were some some little questions and it didn't look like they really uh, lifted a whole lot of stuff. Uh, but, you know, 28 higher here, getting right back into that comfort zone that we've been in for a long time and across, you know, most of the, 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 the complex, the whole bean complex, 28 higher, 1451 in January. Wheat market, uh, you saw, still saw a little bit of spreading between Chicago and KC. Uh, KC ended up being 17 higher on the day. Your, your July next year, KC wheats at 926. Uh, while your Chicago wheat, Chicago is 813, that's up 10, uh, and then July is up 9 cents as well, 852. Jacob, we've gotten some preliminary reports about the crop in South America, but what do we know about it so far? Is it too early still to take anything away from that? Well, I think uh, it is. I mean, it's it's it's, it's hard to, to go in there and start guessing about a, a crop before the, the growing season, you know, is, is commenced. You know, but I, I look at what they're what's going into the ground, and any time that they can get their beans in early, it doesn't help us out from our corn perspective. Uh, if they get in earlier, they don't. They they do a pretty good job waiting and being patient to plant until they have the moisture. If they get the moisture, they get the crop in the ground, and that then that inevitably allows them to get their second crop in, which is the safrina corn crop which allows the, them to export, you know, that's their big export market. Uh, you know, the Argentina uh, drought situation that you've seen, you've heard a lot of rumors about what the wheat uh, coming out of Argentina is. Uh, that's something that's, uh, you know, still left, uh, you know, a little bit of question mark. Uh, but I think the thing, the thing that you have to rely on is what these private uh, analysts are doing down in South America. Some private groups, CONAB, uh, came out with some increased numbers and the uh, you know, South American production of corn and beans, both. So that's something that uh, you have to keep your eye on, keep focused on. USDA kind of took a punt uh, this week on on what we're we're putting. Uh, just you know, came across the same as what we've had in there. So uh, you know, I think that that's that's got to be on everybody's radar from a marketing perspective uh, as you look out into the spring, uh, especially in the soybeans. You know, what their production does. I mean, this is going to give us some good opportunities at this point that can be gone pretty quick uh, if we see a good uh, South American crop. We've gotten some guidelines, some more information. It seems like at least what the Chinese government would like to see as far as some goals for reaching um, the spots where they feel comfortable and getting rid of some of the COVID restrictions. But is that just a case where we just have to follow the day to day and kind of wait and see what happens with China with those COVID restrictions? <laughs> yeah, if you have a direct line of China, let me have it. I still probably won't believe it uh, as far as what they're going to do. Uh, it gives a it gives the market does a, a lot of faith that we can see some type of uh, you know export plan uh, potentially into China. I think what scares me the most right now is even if they're lifting their uh, restrictions, uh, if that business comes back to us, I'll still be a little bit surprised uh, after negotiating with uh, South America to to in, import uh, some of the South American beans. So uh, that those restrictions, I think from the trade situation that we have, uh, telling them that we're not going to be 
uh, selling them any semiconductors and the other uh, you know restrictions that are in, along with all the trade. Uh, I think that you have to still look at uh, you know negative exports here as far as soybeans go, and I, I don't see that that lifting it right now is anything that can truly happen. I do think it gives us faith that it could happen. Jacob, what was the story on the livestock markets today? Uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, you know, the, the first thing that I noticed this morning is when box beef uh, came out, it came down pretty, pretty uh, heavily lower, like over three bucks lower in the, in, uh, uh, the choice. And then select was down a, another buck. So your, your, your spread has also narrowed. Uh, the live cattle market fell off a buck 50 to a buck 70 uh, pretty quick right after those came out. Uh, and I think that just put the bat, a negative tone across all of the livestock. Live uh, feeder cattle were down three dollars in, in twelve cents. Uh, you had a really strong day yesterday that took back most of those gains. So the feeder cattle in a thinly traded market, you know, reminded me a lot of what the soybeans just uh, kind of just the opposite of what we we saw yesterday. Uh, corn market being up a little bit didn't help the feeder cattle as well. Uh, on the hog side of things, you're still seeing some major bear spread uh, from this uh, this cash market has has been pretty steady. Uh, but the front months of the futures have been selling off and, and then buying in the back months. And so a pretty quiet day in the hogs. Uh, live cattle kind of took the brunt of it in the front months and, uh, you know, end up, uh, you know, pushing, uh, pushing feeder cattle down as well, as well. Jacob, thank you as always for the market analysis. For our viewers who would like to get in touch, get some more great information, how can they do so? Well, I encourage everybody to look at our website, agmarket.net. Um, take a 30-day free trial there of all of our intel. And from there, you can take a look us up individually. Uh, you can give me a call here, 608-384-5438. Have a good day. He is Jacob Burks from agmarket.net. Jacob, thank you so much for the time. Have a great weekend. Hey, you too, guys. Thanks for having me. Great weekend to you. Happy Veterans Day. And that was Jacob Burks of agmarket.net. It's time now to take a look at how the numbers closed. Those numbers brought to us courtesy of the folks at Bar Chart. December corn is up four and three quarters at 658 even. November soybeans up 25 even at 1455 and a half. Soybean meal for January up $3.20 at 403.60. Soybean oil for January up 91 cents at 74.54. Chicago wheat up 10 and a quarter at 813 and three quarters. Minneapolis wheat is up 14 and a quarter at 945 and three quarters. Kansas hard red wheat up 18 and a quarter at 943 and a half. And December oats up eight and three quarters at 387 even. On the Merck, live cattle for December down $1.55 at 15152. November feeder cattle down $1.67 at $176.95. Lean hogs for December down 52 cents at $84.35. Pork cutout for December down 75 cents at $94.75. And class three milk for November down one cent at $20.95. And that's been a check of the Ag Market Recap here on Ag Matters PM. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break to hear from our sponsor, the Iowa Soybean Association and the Soy Checkoff. And when we come back, I will have the latest installment of Between the Pods. Today, I speak with ISA, Iowa Soybean Association Senior Director of Market Development, Grant Kimberly. This is Ag Matters PM. Iowa Soybean Association is driven to deliver for Iowa's 40,000 soybean farmers. We're proud to provide objective agronomic research, a helping hand with soil and water stewardship, and timely industry news powered by the Soybean Checkoff. Learn more at IASoybeans.com. Welcome back to Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Mark Magnuson. Today, I visit with Senior Director of Market Development at the Iowa Soybean Association, Grant Kimberly, about soybean markets overseas, possible areas of expansion for soybean exports, and how the Iowa Soybean Association is always searching for new markets in order to sell Iowa soybeans. It's time to go between the pods with the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network and the Iowa Soybean Association. For the next year, we will explore the ways Iowa-grown soybeans are making a difference at home and around the world. Now, here's your host of Between the Pods, Mark Magnuson. Mark Magnuson for the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, and it is the latest installment of Between the Pods. And I am here at the Iowa Soybean Association headquarters in Ankeny, and I'm joined by Grant Kimberly. Grant, could you start off by telling us what are your job responsibilities within the ISA? 
Yes, uh, my name is Grant Kimberly, so I'm Senior Director of Market Development at Iowa Soybean Association. And what that means is I oversee all of our demand building programs. Uh, I oversee our demand committee with our farmer, farmer directors that we, where we make our investments to, to grow demand for soybeans, whether it be international marketing on the export side, working with our livestock partners uh, domestically, or also working on value-added and bio-based product initiatives. Uh, and then also biofuels is a big uh, market driver as well. Grant, what are some of the market trends right now for soybean exports? What are you seeing right now? Well, you know, overall soybean exports uh, aren't, aren't doing too bad right now. We might be uh, down just a little bit uh, with some headwinds when it comes to, you know, the strong value of the U.S. dollar uh, and some other economic issues around the world. Of course, with China uh, kind of periodically locking down with, with some of their zero tolerance COVID policies. Uh, that's creating some headwind, headwinds and some challenges. But with all that being said, we're still seeing pretty good export numbers for soybeans and things are looking good. And, and there's a lot of different market opportunities around the world. And is China the big one then because of those lockdown protocols? They just don't have as much soybean demand right now? Yeah, it slows it down a little bit. I think maybe on the back end, you'll still see that come to fruition uh, later. But, uh, uh, you know, they are the biggest market when it comes to, to soybeans. They buy 60% of the world's globally traded or globally available for export uh, soybeans. So they are the big market. But we are working really hard to continue to diversify our market opportunities around the world to other places as well. And Grant, when we talk about these opportunities for Iowa soybeans to be sold outside of the country's borders, we know that Iowa soybeans are very popular because we have proof of that. We have visitors from other countries that come to Iowa specifically to buy Iowa soybeans. What have you found to be their reasoning? What do they like to tell you as far as why they like to make those deals? That's right. During uh, the harvest season in particular, we have a lot of visitors from overseas, uh, a lot of the major soybean buyers and small and large uh, from all over the world that come here. Uh, and so what they like to do is they like to go out to the farms. They like to visit with their farmers uh, to see how we're harvesting these crops, see what the quality looks like, what the yield and production is looking like this season, uh, and just to, to see and taste it uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, figuratively speaking, uh, up close and personal, and then talk to those growers and those farmers. And we also just link the entire value chain. So we go to the co-op, we go to uh, the processor, the uh, export terminal, and, and they get to see how the entire value chain uh, all fits together. What are those visits like? Have you found that international visitors, do they think that a soybean operation here in the United States is vastly different? Are there maybe more similarities than we might think? Well, I mean, everybody farms differently all over the world. Uh, every No farm is exactly like even here in Iowa. So uh, they just are fascinated to hear from the farmers, to see the different sizes of operations, to see how they do things. Um, but they all take away that there's high uh, care that goes into uh, growing soybeans, and, and uh, a lot of farmers are very uh, attention, take a strong attention to detail and certainly uh, are as, as sustainable as possible. And that's certainly the term that we're hearing more and more that are, is a concern of, of buyers. They want to make sure that their soybeans are grown in a, a very sustainable manner. And so being able to show that our soybeans are grown that way and harvested and transported uh, very sustainably makes a big difference to create that customer preference for U.S. soybean products. And that only makes a ton of sense. I mean, if you're buying soybeans and things go well, you're probably going to want to buy them in the future. So you hope that that can sustain and continue. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so it's a globally traded commodity. And certainly uh, we work in a lot of different fronts where we try to just grow gen gen general uh, demand for soybeans. But we also are working to get, build customer preference for Iowa and U.S. soybeans and soybean meal products. Uh, and so it's a, it's a mixed and diversified portfolio of how we go about working with our partnerships at U.S. Soybean Export Council and our buyers and our customers from around the world. Grant, are those deals always done ahead of time and then they take the visit? Or is it a chance possibly for the international visitors to see how the soybeans are grown here in Iowa and say, we want to be a part of this, let's make a deal here or I guess make a bigger deal than we had planned on? It's a little bit of both. Uh, certainly, uh, a lot of the buyers have familiarity and have purchased uh, from Iowa and the U.S. before, uh, but sometimes they're new ones as well, uh, or they're, they're new at their role at, within a, a company that purchases soybeans. And so sometimes it's just educating the new uh, up-and-coming staff members of some of these importers about you know, how soybeans are grown and, and how we are uh, the care that we take and sustainability measures that go into to growing soybeans. And so it's 
education and so we do have a mixture of deals that are done ahead of time and then deals that happen on the fly once they get here and, and they see you know what the quality of the soybean crop looks like. These types of deals and other deals that you're looking at when trying to expand these markets for Iowa soybeans, are they generally going to be soybeans whole or are they going to be soybean meal? It's going to be both. Uh, from a national standpoint, we still export more whole soybeans uh, than, than anything, uh, but uh, we are processing or crushing more and more soybeans each and every year. Some of that's because of the demand now for soybean oil due to the growth in biodiesel and renewable diesel and the, the desire for governments and corporations to lower their carbon emissions and their energy output uh, when it comes to, to those kinds of things. So renewable fuels are growing. That means we're, we have to crush more soybeans to provide more oil. So in the future, we're going to see more and more soybean meal being exported as well. And we have customers around the world that we work on uh, with that as well. And each customer has different needs and different uh, requirements. And so some are more meal oriented customers like the Philippines is a great customer that has a preference for U.S. and Iowa meal. Uh, we work very closely with those buyers. Um, actually, we have a trade mission coming up uh, to go over and meet with those buyers uh, after Thanksgiving this year. Uh, and and so and then other markets like maybe Egypt, it's going to be more of a whole bean market, and that's a growing market as well. So it just depends on the market area. Grant, you and the rest of your um, co-workers here at the ISA would know better than anyone, but do you think the average person even fully realizes that when they drive by a soybean field in Iowa that those beans might end up you know somewhere halfway across the world they might end up as something also that they don't even know soybeans can be used for like we know that soybeans can be used in aquaculture for example to feed fish and shrimp and things like that do you think the average person is able to I guess fully realize that and I guess that's part of the reason why we're talking today you know, if you're not directly connected to the farm or to agriculture, you may not realize uh, how they're being utilized. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that's part of our job, too, is to educate not only our c customers and consumers around the world, but also ours, those that are domestic here and, and local. Uh, and, yeah, soybeans is a very... Uh, uh, international crop. Uh, we export about 60% of all that we produce in the U.S. So uh, we are exporting more than we utilize here domestically. And again, that's in the form of whole beans, soybean meal, or soybean oil. So it just depends on, on uh, you know, which market it's going to be. But exports are very, very important to agriculture and to soybeans in particular. Moving these soybeans overseas, trying to make those connections. Obviously, you're going to spend some money trying to do that. But I've seen the numbers. There's really good return on that investment of trying to get people's attention about Iowa soybeans. What do those numbers look like, Grant? Because it's almost, I think, a little bit hard to believe when you first read them. Yeah, there's been some different uh, analysis uh, and studies that have looked at some of these different uh, investments that we make as an industry, just uh, collectively, whether it be the soybean farmers investing in the checkoff resources or it's uh, some of the United States Department of Agriculture foreign market development programs and foreign ag service programs, and then, of course, the export industry. All of us combined work together to leverage those dollars to, to try to enhance our exports, and, and it depends on what study you look at, but in, in general, you're, you're usually talking a, a 20 to 1 or, or 30 to 1 return on investment uh, on on some of these and like I said we're building general demand for soybeans uh, we're helping them utilize more soybeans in the feed ration whether it be aquaculture or, or other other livestock products or value-added products industrial uses too um, but certainly um, you know it's it's just a, a combination of lots of different factors are other states and other checkoffs and other states as involved are they as active as the Iowa Soybean Association when it comes to getting the soybean deals done in international markets we all work together it's a partnership and a lot of times our buyers are coming into multiple states because uh, they're wanting to buy from multiple different locations and it depends on too if they're going to be buying more out of the gulf of mexico origin you know the port of new orleans uh, louisiana or if they're going to be buying more from the pacific northwestern ports so it might depend a little bit on where they're logistically going to be purchasing from, what states they might go visit and, and have more relationships with. But we all work together on this. Certainly Iowa and Illinois are the leading soybean producing states. So um, the epicenter tends to be right here uh, in the middle of the country. But uh, all the states work together. We work it through collectively and we work with our international export arm called the U.S. Soybean Export Council to all facilitate additional exports. 
Now, I think we know a lot of the countries that soybeans are sold to. Are there any markets right now, though, that the Iowa Soybean Association in particular is looking at and saying there might be an opportunity here? Maybe this is an area we haven't necessarily focused on a lot in the past, but it could be there as a potential market. You know, we look at the world uh, regionally, and then also we look at the type of markets there are. Some markets are more of a mature market, other markets are, are a, a, a emerging or, or newer market, and some are just a growth market. Uh, they may be, have been around for a little while, but they're still growing rapidly. So it depends on each market. Uh, but, you know, we look at, you know, China is still critically important just because of the sheer volume uh, that, that goes there, and they still have growth potential as well. But then we look at meal markets, and especially places like Southeast Asia. Mexico and, and Central America are, are important markets for us. And then another growing area that we see uh, demand and growth because of the growing middle class and more uh, consumption of poultry and aquaculture is Egypt, North Africa, parts of the Middle East. Um, Morocco is another area that we're seeing some growth in. Uh, Pakistan, before uh, COVID happened, uh, we had a trade delegation in Pakistan um, and uh, Bangladesh. And so those are markets that are growing too that traditionally have been much smaller. Uh, so there's new opportunities there. And of course, Europe is still going to be important for us going forward too. And another question I was going to ask you earlier, and I didn't get to it yet. Um, we've talked a lot with market analysts and other people about, it seems like there's a lot of turmoil in the world right now, and it doesn't. It does seem abnormal. And they would agree with us. They say, yes, there's more going on now than even usual. So how has that affected then the soybeans uh, side of things when you think about exporting? Because yes, there's just so much turbulence happening right now around the world. Well, that's one of the stories we like to tell is if you want stability, you want consistency, high quality supply and consistent supply, uh, we are the place to come right here in the United States. We have that ability to be stable market. Uh, we, we have good production most of the years and uh, we have the logistics to, to get it around the world. So yeah, there's a lot of instability around the world right now, especially what you're seeing in Russia and Ukraine going on. Um, that impacts uh, the oil seed and grain markets in particular because uh, uh, Ukraine's a major sunflower oil seed uh, exporter. Uh, and so there's some substitution that can happen with some of these different oil seed crops. So it's providing other opportunities for U.S. exporters and our competition being in South America as well. So we have to be as competitive as we can on the world market with our competitors in South America and around the world. And, and I think our message of consistency and reliability is really always at the forefront. Grant, is there anything else you'd like to let our viewers here on Between the Pods know about when it comes to what ISA is doing to try and expand these international markets? Well, one other uh, big market opportunity that I want to talk about is um, uh, Ag Processing Incorporated, AGP, has recently uh, announced an, a major expansion of their port facility on P Pacific Northwest and Grace Harbor. And I think we probably have talked about this before. And of course, Mike Steenhook at the Soy Transportation Coalition has been very involved with that as well. And we helped uh, to work together with AGP and the different uh, agencies out there to get uh, uh, to support, I guess, uh, AGP had to do the, the, the work on that, but we helped to, uh, to also support the, uh, to get another grant to, to improve and expand that port facility. So that facility had exported roughly, you know, 3 million metric tons of soybean meal a year. Now by, uh, the expansion is going to occur, it's going to double and go up to 6 million metric tons of soybean meal exports a year. We only historically have, have exported about 12 to 13 million metric tons of soybean meal. So that's a big jump. And that's because we got, we're going to have more meal to export. So those is, are other examples. We have to continue to work to improve our logistics and our ability to, to get that gateway opportunity to make us as efficient as possible to access those markets around the world. And that's another example to, to help uh, grow this export terminal out in the Pacific Northwest. And that's also a great example of Iowa farmers using, helping to use those checkoff funds, investing in the infrastructure here that helps to get those soybeans overseas. So it's a really good example right there. Uh, Grant, thank you so much again for the time here on Between the Pods and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. That was Grant Kimberly with the Iowa Soybean Association. As for right now, let's take a look at the Ag Weather Outlook. Well, it's a much cooler day here in the state of Iowa as we were expecting. On Wednesday, we had a very nice day. Yesterday, Thursday, began as a very mild day and by the end of the day had cooled off considerably into the 30s around much of the state. And that continues to be the case here today. Here in Des Moines, it is windy and very cool. And we are going to see that trend continue for the foreseeable future. So let's turn our attention now to the National Weather Service and what the National Weather Service has in store for the next 24 hours.
As you can see from the National Weather Service, the worm has turned. Partly cloudy today, but much cooler than in recent days. Highs in the upper 20s to upper 30s. Tonight, partly to mostly cloudy with a chance of flurries in north central and northwest Iowa. Low temperatures in the mid-teens tonight to upper 20s. Chances for some sunshine in the south and west tomorrow. Chances for snow to the north and in eastern parts of Iowa. Highs in the upper 20s to mid-30s. And turning our attention now to our affiliate weather map and tomorrow's forecast, Cherokee will be sunny but cool, a high temperature around 28. Shenandoah, much of the same, sunny and cool, a little bit warmer with a high expected around 33. In the central part of the state, Des Moines partly cloudy on Saturday and 33. Albia partly cloudy, also 33. Waterloo, partly cloudy on Saturday, cooler, with a temperature around 32. And Clinton, partly cloudy, a little bit warmer, with a high around 36. For a more detailed forecast in your part of the state, check with your local Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network affiliate. And that's been a check of the Ag Weather Outlook. That also brings us to the end of this episode of Ag Matters PM. You can find all of our content on our website at iowaagnet.com. You can also follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And you can find our video content and previous episodes of AMPM on our YouTube channel. Don't forget our free twice-daily market podcast on Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, and Podbean. From the IARN studios in Des Moines, I'm Mark Magnuson. On behalf of Riley Smith and Dustin Huffman, thank you for watching. This has been Ag Matters PM.